Um, I'm Mary Jo Fresh. I'm chair of the steering committee, and welcome this afternoon to our Johnson's talk. And it's my pleasure to introduce her to you. Our Dean Nelson holds a BS in art education, an MA in sculpture and photography, and an MFA in photography. Our Dean came to Ohio State in the Department of Photography and Cinema in 1974. She retired from the Department of Art in 2011. Besides teaching all aspects of photography during her tenure, in the summer of 1995, she taught the first Adobe Photoshop course at Ohio State in the Central Classrooms Computer Lab. She has exhibited nationally and internationally. Our dean has received the Ohio Arts Council and Greater Columbus Arts Council Individual Artist Fellowships. She was a greatest, the Greater Columbus Arts Council Visiting Artist in Spain in the early 90s and has visited Slovakia to teach alternative camera workshops. Her work is included in numerous public collections, including the Columbus Museum of Art, John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Museum of Contemporary Photography at Columbia College, Chicago, Museum of Fine Arts, Houston, Museo uh, Arte Moderna do Rio de Janeiro, <laughs> I'm trying here, and Tesnish Sam Lugan Muzin de Stadt Dresden, among others. Nelson's practice includes the tradition and traditional and non-traditional use of cameras and materials. Her German Schubergarten work has been recognized through a Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts Grant and a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship in Photography. Her body of work, Ceilings, explores formal visual aspects of structures in the process of repurposing, renovation, or slated for demolition. Nelson's most recent images explore specimens housed in the Ohio State Museum of Biological Diversity Collections. Today, our Dean's talk is how to create considered visual research, recent works from the OSU Museum of Biological Diversity. Please join me in welcoming our Dean. Uh, thank you. I'd like to try and just talk. Can you hear me? Okay. Because I, w I move around a lot and I, I don't do well with microphones. So if I ever get a little wave or something. And to get started here, a couple things. One is I don't want to wait until the end. If anybody's got a question about anything, just wave, yell out, hey, Ardeen, what about? Okay. I'd rather do it when something's on the screen and it makes more sense to answer the question. The other thing is, I try to be funny, but I'm not. And so, <laughs> <laughs> good, you laughed, yay. Um, at, at any time that you think something maybe is funny, go ahead and laugh, because I'm trying to do it. <sighs> I have a hard time about it. Um, so, okay, I had to come up with a title, and I came up with this one, because it is the most recent work at the museum here on campus, but I'm going to start further back. And for some of you who have been sitting here, you've seen some of these old pictures. So I'll explain some things. I was born in Chicago, but my mother's from a farm in the middle of North Dakota. So as a kid, I spent time on the farm every summer from the time I was like six months old, actually. And so I learned to do a lot of things, like be around dead animals and taking chicken feathers out of chickens, right? Um, I am up on the table. I'm not as tall as Grandpa yet. And come on now, be good. Um, I, I learned to drive trucks and tractors and all of that. Farm kids, you have to do all that sort of thing. Um, in fact, Grandma pretty much taught me how to drive a truck how to shoot a rifle, which I can do. Fred will attest to it. My partner Fred's here, and he can attest to the fact I can shoot a gun. Um, and grow vegetables and flowers. Now, this becomes important through a lot of the work and when you see what happens in Germany with the Schreber Gardens, et cetera. So there we go. Um, and this is the first that I know of picture of me holding a camera. And uh, me and my brother and the kids from the other farms around. I don't remember photographing with that, but that's the first one I know of. I think it's old brownie. Um, the 
coming here to Ohio State was really pretty interesting. Ohio State, you may or may not know this, OSU taught the first four credit photography class in the country in 1890. The Department of Photography was formed in 1895. Okay. When I came in 1974, I was told later on that I was the first woman faculty person in the department. Um, it, this month is Women's Month, <laughs> and Mary Jo and I were kidding about wearing white, except I never wear white, so I'm wearing black. It's just normal me. Um, anyway, here we go. What is, because I said I'd talk about visual research, what is visual research? How can you start to define that and think about it? Depend photography is this huge possibility. And I can't think of, I used to do this intro thing with incoming freshmen, and I'd be standing up on stage and I'd go, okay, what's your major? And somebody would say, give me something weird. Um, uh, <laughs> mechanical <laughs> engineering. <laughs> oh, okay, no, well, you know, how <laughs> okay, the way photography is used in that field. And you couldn't come up with a field where photo or cinema was not an aspect of that field. Um, so how do we deal with research in these things? Well, you have to have an idea, okay? As you know in your own research, whatever your field might be, you have to have an idea of something you want to go after. And in the case of photography, if you think about it, photography is really mostly, mainly about selection out of the world. There's all this reality out there. You have to frame it and select it and select a point of view and figure it out. Um, some image makers work with a blank canvas like a painter and start building still lifes, putting objects in. And uh, mainly I select, sometimes I build. It depends, changes all the time. So it is about selection. And to explain a little bit about selection, this is. Yeah, this has a pointer on it, too. Okay, I was going to show you the work from two women, well-known photography uh, people. First one's Dorothea Lang. She worked at, during the Farm Security Administration as one of the photographers traveling around the country documenting. And one of her most famous images you might be familiar with is Migrant Mother. It's been used all sorts of ways and places since the 30s. Uh, what you probably have never seen is the sequence of photographs that lead up to this image. Um, when she first came across this sheer, um, <sighs> pea picker, I think that's what she did, migrant worker, she was there with her kids. This is how she came upon them. They pretty much had, weren't paying any attention except for this one young one there noticed her. And Lang was walking around with a big portable but very large camera that she was working with. So it's, you didn't sneak up on anybody. The next shot, you can see that the older daughter pulled the rocking chair out and is kind of posing. The next one, it's just the mother and the youngest child. Then it moves to this one, bringing one of the kids back in. Um, and again, but then switching to this vertical composition with the three youngest within it. And this is the famous photograph. So it's not a one-off, you just happen to snap a picture, okay? One of the frustrating things to photo people these days, uh, commercial photographers especially, is so many people think, oh, I, I can just take the picture on my cell phone. I don't need to hire a photographer. I don't need a videographer anymore. My phone does just fine. Well, maybe for a lot of purposes, but it depends upon your purpose. If it's really a professional purpose, you need to pay attention to what's going on. Now, the other person, one of my heroes, Deanne Arbus, she uh, did magazine work, fashion sorts of things, plus was an independent artist. And this is just one proof sheet of hers, 120 size film, 
larger film, not 35 millimeters. Some of you probably know what 120 roll film is. Yes, some do, okay. Uh, so this is a proof sheet, one roll of film, 12 pictures. And she found this boy in Central Park. And as you see some of the poses he's going through, you can almost see how she maybe was directing him and posing as if it was a fashion shoot for the clothes that he's wearing. If you had to pick one of these out, which one would you pick out to be the famous one? You know, somebody might know the image, so. Anybody? I know it's a little tricky. This is off the web to get this. Well, the one that stood the test of time is this one, which is actually the first photograph. And he's grimacing. Notice what's in his hand? A toy hand grenade. This is the 60s Vietnam War going on. This became the image that is really quite famous. And off this whole sheet, it's the first one up here before he started mugging in other ways for the camera. It was his first go about what he should do. Equipment. What photo equipment do you need to take with you? Um, I believe in trying to figure it out, go out and do a test. Even if, if I was going to Germany to do something, of course I can't go test and come back and decide I needed another lens. I need to figure out some way to kind of simulate that here and then figure out the equipment I need to make sure I have what I need. And you probably always need something that you forget, so you take too much. And you can really load yourself down with equipment. Um, but one of my pieces of equipment that I've been using since I was a student, not this one because they wear out, this is a Diana camera. It's a plastic camera. It used to be $2 and eight popsicle sticks. When I first found it, it takes 120 roll film. And uh, yeah, I've been photographing with that since the 60s, actually. And what kind of images does this camera make? Well, here's, this is the camera opened up. And what I've done, I alter things. I mess around with things all the time. Instead of the typical frame at the back, which would create a square, I, it's plastic. So I can show it to you because I've got it here with me. I carved away the plastic from both sides. So at the image, a lens always makes a circular image. And the only reason you got squares and rectangles is because you're blocking out part of that circular image. Well, what it's letting it do is that circular image expand out. And the edge of the circular image begins to get less sharp and lose exposure, lose density. So using that possibility, this is one with uh, the rectangle, the square being there, Devil's Tower. You might recognize it. Um, this, oh, this is here for two purposes. One, I did a lot of Polaroid work, too. And uh, I wanted, this is here because of this frame, actually. But it also gets into something else about how I approach things in the landscape and doing things. And it has to do with, I, here's this big structure, this white church that was practically a block long, and I was trying to figure out how to deal with it. And I have my Polaroid camera, so I'm out there. Remember, Polaroids used to be how you could instantly see your picture, as opposed to the kids now. They think you always could see a picture immediately on the back of your camera. <laughs> they don't know what it was like. Okay. Um, anyway, the Polaroid camera, I would go about reforming structures and compacting them or reseeing, visualizing how they could look. Looking over in this corner, you can see these stair steps going down, this dark area, shadow in there. To understand what a Diana camera does to a scene like this, this is a two-frame Diana camera of that corner. It's the stairs going down in the railing. And this is probably, I don't mean to offend anything, but anybody, but sort of how I feel about religion. It's sort of scary and creepy and dark. Anyway, um, that was my reaction. And I was you know, putting it out there. Um, this gives you an idea of what the projected image, how it sort of falls off. It reminds me of late 50s televisions that were straight lines across the top. Yeah, you know, right? And this curve out here, the way that felt. Um, this is from when I was in Spain. And I was there with Pinhole. 
plastic camera and regular traditional cameras. Um, so in these are black and white, but you might see some coloring on them because I have at times done a lot of hand coloring as a way of working with black and white and starting to play with the perception of space because of the coloring. Um, and this is actually the bottom of the merry-go-round and two boys that were riding their horses down there. But because of that cutaway, I started doing things with that two-frame thing by the church, we had the frame lines in between that I was hiding in the darkness. This, the edge of one picture is here and the other one overlaps. And you see how they begin to blend together and you don't really see it as almost continuous. Um, I, in this case, I'm aiming up, of course, in the tree and then down at the ground and blending those two together. Um, I also had the opportunity to go to Scotland, and this is in Glasgow. The um, cathedral there was from, I looked it up today, 1839. Um, this is one of the two frames that it's happening right through the center. You don't really totally notice it. But if you look at it, the perception of looking down a wall versus looking into a pillar. On the left is a pillar I'm looking more into, and the second shot is more down the whole wall. Or this is in the uh, Acropolis, which is right above the cathedral there, where you get perhaps a, a clearer picture of how this single image is blending with this one through that area. Anyway, the way this looks on film, this is me holding film on a light table, Back when I had to do things in an enlarger, I was limited to how many frames. Uh, once scanners came along, got good, I could expand that and do as many frames as sometimes a whole roll of film within an environment, moving around within an environment. And I could scan it and then print it out of the computer. So um, that changed things about my practice. This is um, outside the castle in Prague, which is a wonderful city I got to go to when I was in Germany and then over to uh, Czechoslovakia or the Czech Republic or Bohemia, which is how my family would talk about it. My mother's maiden name is Kachira, Kasira, <laughs> Bohemian. Okay, anyway, um, this has like eight or nine frames in it. If I look real carefully, I can start to try and count them. But I'm moving from an area looking over the city of Prague to the castle, to some of the landscape around the castle. You'll see these, this hedgerow coming through here, the hedge come around. Well, this is another moving somewhere else, connecting this up. And I've gotten really good at remembering where things were to make these things overlap and blend into each other. And coming around to, this is a, a water feature there in the formal garden. And the last shot is me looking down into it where the lilies are in that. So um, these, these things, I can print them. They work big, like 80 inches long. So they really hold together large, which means you can really see all sorts of information. This is an execution yard in Dresden, the memorial that's there. They were beheading people through the 50s in this area, right outside what had been a uh, court courthouse. Uh, and moving around, there's only four figures in there, but I'm moving around and photographing and photographing from another angle and you get this real feeling of many people. Uh, this one, you may, there, there's one of these, a big one of these over in the Ohio Union. This was when the Lazarus Building downtown, when they started renovating it. Um, several of us, Fred and I included, were invited to come down and make art, right? You know, we say that to art people. Come make art, okay, free, do anything. Um, and I couldn't help but start working with Diana. And this is technically 
this would be, these windows would be a flat wall, but I'm moving around and photographing them from different angles, creating a different space out of it. Um, this is kind of like a proof sheet, but things, I, yes, I've done things that are interiors. Um, sometimes they're five or six frames, sometimes they're eight or nine or 10 frames. It all depends on the environment and what I, how I end up seeing it. A friend of mine saw me once photographing in the backyard and he likened it to, I like this, to me doing a dance with the environment because I'm moving in and up and around and back and having a great time doing it. Uh, pinhole, pinhole, the simplest camera. All you need is any sort of light type device that you can put anything that's sensitive to light in and a pr piece of something like brass shim stock with a tiny pinhole in it. Now there's a formula, square root of the focal length divided by 141 equals the diameter of the drill bit that would make the ideal pinhole size for that focal length camera. <laughs> Memorized, yeah. Um, <laughs> I've used that formula a lot because I've worked a lot with students with these cameras and like that, and we build cameras all over the place and in various ways. Um, a pinhole camera technically will make everything in front of that lens out to infinity equally in focus at the same time, which is not typical at all with a lens that you focus. Um, one of the classes I used to teach was alternative camera. Diana, a pinhole, a variety of other things, Polaroid, etc. And we always did a designer camera pinhole show, which was uh, why well, I drink a lot of coffee, can you tell? Um, and whoops. whoops, 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 get back there. No, no, wrong way, wrong way. Ah, um, so this is a Hills Brother coffee can top. This is a uh, coffee filter holder from an old uh, Mr. Coffee. The, there's a piece of paper, photographic paper that's inside there being held by that lid. In the drip hole is where my brass shim stock is with my pinhole in it. So it was a paper negative that I then could put on a flatbed scanner and scan in the computer and make any size print out of it I might want to, hence that picture. Um, here's another one because I'm really into plants and flowers and all of that, a flower pot. This again is paper under that flower pot. The pinhole is right up there and this is my beanie baby that was my shutter to block off the pinhole until I was ready to make the exposure. And a couple of beanie babies in there. This actually is <laughs> a paper negative from one of the prints, that paper negative, put back in the still life scene that I built up in this environment outside and photographed so it turns out as a negative because it was a negative in the photograph. Um, okay, um, I'm going to have to get quicker here, but I have this buddy in town, George Anderson, commercial shooter, who shoots Hasselblad and 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I don't know, he bought the fancy digital back for the Hasselblad. Cost him something like about $28,000. My brass shim stock with a hole in it cost two cents. So we put his digital back with my pinhole and here is the back. There's a black box I built on the front of it with a little pinhole in the front of it to be able to make an exposure like that and or like that. This is a, a little flower, you know, about this big. It's the house next door kind of thing. Um, okay, or uh, train people in the garden by my squash plants or being crazy and I, when I do the designer pinhole show with the students, I always thought of something that was important to me that year. And I was doing a lot of printing, something about that later. This is the inner paper roll from my big rolls of paper 
to print on. And there's nine pinholes across here. I took a whole roll of 120 film and had put it down inside that so that I could expose the whole roll of film anyway. Um, my largest pinhole, functional pinhole camera, would take 20 by 24 paper or film. I actually had a buddy that had 20, 24 color neg film that uh, was a half barrel, flat front, curved back. So its angle of view was almost a full 180 degrees. What kept it from being that was the thickness of the metal that the pinhole was in. Really fun and interesting. So these are large contact prints that would be very, very sharp. And uh, I'm going to go really fast here. Spain. Um, not knowing what was going to happen, I was supposed to go to Spain as a visiting artist to teach Pinhole and Diana. And I hit the ground, and they go, oh, we're not doing anything this week. It's Holy Week. Holy Week in southern Spain. Oh, my God. If you ever can go, it's incredible. Um, and so I had no idea, except I started photographing, going, I have to document this. Look at this. Um, the different brotherhoods from each church um, had their attire of different colors. They kept asking me about the Ku Klux Klan, and they said, are they devil worshipers? And I said, yes, and they liked that. And so, because the outfit looks the same. You know, it's back to the Spanish Inquisition. Anyway, um, it's a big family affair, this week-long event. And this is inside another church, but I'm going to move really quick. Polaroid. Um, the idea of landscape and reforming or putting back together the landscape or being upset about what happens to it. Near my house, they took down a bunch of old trees. They built a rec center with a big parking lot and put in these little tree guys. Well, you can see what I did to the parking lot. I made it as small as possible and tried to give some space to the trees. You'll also notice how it's kind of gridded, almost like that proof sheet. Uh, Polaroid, uh, transfer process, playing around with reforming things that way. Green spaces, this gets to Germany and Schreber Gardens. Um, in 1860s, Dr. Schreber in Leipzig <laughs> decided that all the Industrial Revolution, all these people coming to Leipzig to live no longer had fresh food, fresh air, all of that. They were squashing these apartments. So he talked the government into leasing land, government land, to these people to be able to have gardens. And they could have small structures on them. And the garden, this is a, more than allotments in England. And this whole thing really started in Leipzig, Germany. Um, supposed to be one-third grass, one-third flowers, one-third uh, vegetables. Nobody abides by those rules at all, <laughs> it seems, which is really odd for Germany. But um, here's one gentleman's. Uh, this structure back here is an office building. His was over on the edge of this garden area. Uh, the walkways are such that the public can walk through and view all these gardens and see what's going on. At least that's one of the rules. So in many of my pictures, there'll be a bit of fencing there to kind of show where that edge is. Um, here's another where they have done things to try and block it. They've grown some high bushes so that people walking by could not see in so easily. I found a corner to get into and able to photograph into their structure there and out front here was a uh, tent thing, etc. And they even between two gardens, they're back to back here, they have the posts and the uh, bean plants. They have things like swimming pools, <laughs> which I thought was really wild. Um, it was just amazing walking around and seeing all these different places. Dresden has more than 350 associations. Within those associations, there could be anywhere from, I think the smallest is about 35 garden areas, up to the larger one that I found was over 350 gardens within that association. Um, I got finally my first sabbatical 
in 08. <laughs> I know, that was my first sabbatical, 08, 09. Um, going back because I wanted to go photograph. I had been there in the summer. Fred, my partner over there, had been in Germany for three months visiting artists in Dresden through GCAC. So I went over to visit a few weeks. And we always have to figure out splitting up the world. He was doing interiors and I saw the gardens. And of course, with my background, I wanted the gardens. So that's what I went after. Uh, so back there, in, able to go in the autumn, in the winter with snow, and then in the spring, which I hadn't been able to up till that time. I had been back there five times, but only in the middle of summer. And this was a photograph I made. And yeah, there's certain things about it. Um, this weed was going up, and I think I lined noticed it, lined it up with that tree trunk way in the background. And I love the white frame, the frame within the frame. OK, so I'm back in the same association in winter and made that photograph, not realizing I was in the same place oh. and approaching it in the same way. But then when I get all this stuff in the computer and start looking, I'm going, wait a minute. And I realize I made the same photograph. So there was some kind of visual, I'll call it visual truth, to the composition. And so in the spring, I very consciously went back to the same place again. And this is how they were treating it the following spring. So that's one of the things that was really interesting to me. This is one of the really large garden areas. Uh, this is four lane roadway here and a big sports thing here. So you get a sense of how big these things are. Um, that thing about having to have a public area, well, many of them, most of them had some kind of fence uh, that you could look over. Notice what they've done. They have a walkway back. See the fence, the um, hedge? Mm -hmm. That's their private area back there. So they're complying with the rules. Really interesting. Or this one, oh, I love this one. No formal fence, but when you walk up to it, there's a gate. And there was a bell at the gate. I mean, of course, you could just walk around. But the tradition would be you have to be invited in, which is something that went on uh, for me there. And I did not go in anywhere I wasn't invited. And I started formally meeting with Garden Association people um, to talk about. They wanted to know about uh, community gardens in the United States. And I photographed around Columbus and talked to people here. And, Etc. and exchange information. Um, I call this guy Tarzan. He, uh, when I display, whoops, sorry, hit the wrong button here. When I display these, this is English, this is German translation of a little bit I found out about him. He was in the army in World War II, and this particular garden association was on old army uh, land in Dresden. And when he was this young man, he planted these three trees in the 40s. Now his garden backs up against that area, which I thought was incredibly interesting. And I'm not going to read them all. This guy, though, is into his trains and takes them in the winter and uh, repaints them, etc. But within the, all the trains, there'll be flowers and vegetables growing as part of the greenery to make his train layout, or this man. Uh, they had just gotten this garden. It was well over 100 years old. This original structure here, they were adding on to because they have a couple of kids. So younger people are going back to the gardens. And these two friends, oh god, this was so incredible. You know about the fire bombing of Dresden. This garden was kind of up on the hill. When these people were children, her family garden, these get handed down generationally, by the way. Her family garden was on this side. His was right across over on this side. And he was talking about during the fire bombing, his dad took him out in the garden there and used tin metal over the top of them. But they sat there watching the fire bombing going on down in the city. Uh, ceilings that got mentioned. Uh, Lazarus, uh, invited to make art. Um, go in there with Fred, and we have to split the world up again. Fred had been doing walls, and 
<sighs> I'll just say it that way. Sorry, Fred. And I'm looking around figuring out, okay, what am I going to do? There's no plants in here. Um, and I happened to look up and went, oh, my God, look at those ceilings. And I started finding compositions everywhere where they were taking down the grill work, the drop ceiling, and uh, you were finding old things. It had been redone. That part of the building was built in the 1850s, so there were multiple redos of it. Um, and they were renovating it with new electric, new HVAC, et cetera. So I had a wonderful time on my knees, <laughs> aiming up on a tr with a tripod at the ceiling, <laughs> running around making these photographs. Um, things like this was uh, the side, the south side, the big windows. Remember the display windows at Christmas? And these are burn marks up in that ceiling from the lighting cans. So there's all kinds of little pieces of things in here that I'm just totally intrigued by. Then we get on campus, and there's buildings around campus that have been either renovated or slated to be torn down. This is Haskett Hall that they tore down as I retired. Um, <laughs> I came there, and it went away when I left. Anyway, <laughs> so photographing in Haskett. And uh, you didn't probably notice, again, a lot of structural things going on here. Uh, compositionally. This is Sullivan, and uh, this is up, well, there was a drop ceiling here, and then this goes up to another level. See how the paint changes? And then up through here, the, the fancy edges from the original um, cornice, what's it called? Wall to ceiling. But then they had broken through to get to HVAC, but you also see the new stuff, including all the new wire for uh, the computers. Uh, Vivian Hall, this is where they had food services over there. I love the pink ceiling. Uh, City Center Mall, you know how they tore that down. I'm going to go really fast here. I noticed it. They were leaving the lights on in the building to keep it warm so that the pipes wouldn't freeze. And so I started pushing about, well, can I make photographs? Well, you need permission for these things, and I uh, had to fight to get the permission. Eventually, I did. I was down there several times, was away. Then they were selling things out, so they started opening up the gates, and I wanted to go down and photograph again. The uh, security guards kind of got to know me and knew I wasn't going to hurt anything or whatever. Um, so I was able to get into some of these structures from the outside or actually getting inside. I don't have any idea what that store was. Uh, was it shoes? Somebody thought it was pillows. I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> very odd. Very odd when you see them empty. Now, this one you realize is Lane Bryant because of that. I did not move those hands. That's no. exactly as I found them. Um, eventually, they allowed the police in there to do uh, bomb sniffing and breaking through walls and all kinds of practice, wow. which is what you see here. And then eventually they took it down. Some of the working crew that I met actually had been people that had built it in the 89, I think it was. This is unlike a garden that you know goes through, dies off in the winter, comes back in the spring, has a normal cycle, has a life cycle. City Center never should have gotten destroyed, but you know it was not at the end of its life cycle. I care about those kinds of things. Here's some uh, quick pictures of an installation. In this case, I, all the gardeners are in a grid. Can you tell I like grids? <laughs> um, the only time I ever did anything collaborative, I'll be real fast here, is an uh, exhibition called Image Self. Some of you may have seen it in 2010 here on campus. And what I did was contact art students from incoming freshmen up through people who had just graduated with a graduate degree, women, and said, I have this project. I want to photograph you. I will make this large print. I will give it to you. You can do anything you want to it with it. Get, bring it back, and we'll have a show. Um, there's a lot of reasons I did it, one being that uh, <laughs> 
for a long time, women artists, never mind. Uh, yeah, it has not been the easiest thing in the world for women artists over time. Anyway, enough said. So uh, this is one of my students, a photo student that came to pick up the print. And she was just like, oh my god. Look how big it is. Well, I told you guys I was going to make you big prints. And they're black and white, and they're on paper that's heavyweight so that it could take paint, it could take whatever somebody might want to do. Here it is in the gallery over at Haskett. You can see some of the results. Uh, some people kept it as a print like that. This one was in printmaking and she folded it all up and added things to it to make this this book out of it. Where others, this woman was in uh, video and at this large print she couldn't figure out, you know, it was like wow. She put it on her wall and did an eight hour video of her sitting in that chair contemplating the picture and we had it playing in the gallery while it was open. Um, to give you an idea of, here's the print that I gave her. This is what she did with it, Polaroid transfer, uh, images of her and her mother. Uh, this one was a swimmer. I couldn't get her to take her top off. I thought, you know, she should, but she didn't want to. Okay. Um, she wanted both a color and a black and white print. And I said, okay, you're, she goes, yeah, I'm putting them together. And so she had this idea about weaving the two together. Um, this woman was just graduating, and the left side is what my photograph looks like. The right side is what she did with blocking it out and doing the graphic graves there and adding the text in another. In another. This one actually is over in the Ohio Union also. Uh, okay, we're finally at the museum. Uh, I'm five minutes later than I wanted to be, but you'll forgive me, I hope. Okay, Museum of Biodiversity. I have been working with plant forms myself and the aging process on plants. I don't have any of them in here. I had a hard time cutting this down. Fred tried to help, but um, <laughs> it's hard. The uh, museum over there is just really exciting. There is an open house every spring, and the first time I was in it, as it is now, um, was a couple of springs ago. And I went, oh, god, this is so incredible. I wonder if they will let me in. And so I had to start asking questions. They did. The three places I have been, and I want to go back to, there are other collections there, the Fish Division, Triple Horn Insect, and Tetrapod. Uh, so starting with the Fish Division, you walk in, and you see these things in jars. And there's reflections everywhere. And it's all discombobulated. And what in the world am I going to do with this? How am I going to uh, go about selecting these things? And, and anything you did, you started there were all kinds of stuff on the walls. How do you isolate things? So black tent, I mean, I knew about this. this, is how you get rid of reflections. You totally surround an area in black velvet up above. You have your light up there, and it cuts out all the reflections. Unlike, well, it's getting better over there, <laughs> reflections um, in that surface. So black tent. Stack focus, um, you can teach an old dog new tricks. I had never done this. I had heard about it. I said, OK. Given what's going on here, I have no depth of field, no sharpness near to far. How am I going to deal with this? I better learn how to do stack focus, which is making a series of photographs and just changing by a millimeter where the lens is focused. So no autofocus, manual focus time. You better not have anything moving. and You better be on a tripod to make this work. It's not just for any purpose. but. Um, I, I think the worst one had like nine frames in it that had to be stacked in Photoshop. But otherwise, things like you can see how this is really out of focus, this edge. There's a part somewhere back here that's sharp. And then the back side of the jar is also very unfocused. But with stack focus, I can keep everything, the label, the detail on the fish, to the back edge of the jar in sharp focus. And these, they would look sharp anyway if they were just little prints. But I don't make little prints. I make 
big prints. And so in order to keep that sharpness, and because I wanted people to be able to inspect the detail in there, I wanted to make sure this would be possible. So um, stack focus. Here's an example. This is the countertop. Uh, the focus is right here. But you see how out of focus, soft, blurry. Blurry, that's out of focus. That is, OK, stack focus. Notice how sharp everything is. Size changes a little bit because when you're in real close, the magnification is such that it's bigger in the frame. As you focus further and further back, it gets smaller and smaller. So in that stack, it has to keep adjusting size and all, and you lose part of your frame. That's another thing I had to learn about, that I had to give extra air, extra space around what I wanted to be able to uh, keep the composition I wanted. Um, things that are reflective and black velvet that doesn't go dead black and, and things reflecting in the glass and trying to make the tent work. This is half a tent. It isn't fully closed in all the way around. And if I hadn't had Fred there helping me, it would be, have been really hard to hold the velvet and clamp it. And you just figure any crazy way you can to get that tent working. Um, so then there is, Fred, isn't this a jar you found? Yeah, yeah he comes one. There are thousands and thousands of things over there. And it's real dark in these spaces, too. Hmm? Yeah, he came to, he, he carrying it by its top and said, you're really going to like this one. Um, I some of these things are quite old. Well, quite old, you know, 80 years old, 100 years old. So they're really old-fashioned jars and all. Um, and I love all the labeling and all. So how deciding what part of this jar, how am I going to do this, what do I want? So oftentimes there was um, moving back and forth and figuring out and turning the jar and then having to wait for all the stuff to settle down again before I could photograph. This is that same jar turned and I could see all the labeling and all in here going, oh, I want to be able to read that, but I want the top of the jar, but it's so tall and skinny. It was, I don't know, maybe about 30 inches tall. And uh, so I'm like, OK, so if I do this side of it, I'm getting that. I'm getting the labels. I'm getting the top of the jar. I like that. Tall, skinny. <sighs> um, lamprey. The lamprey, you can see the final thing over there. The lamprey jar was only about uh, 14 inches tall. It's much smaller in the way I've put the three together, three frames together into a single image. I've made the size consistent with the other devices. Um, and this is a skeletal. And its old jar has this kind of translucent lid on it. Something else that was going on. Fred was pulling things out. I think I have a shot in here later. Pulling objects out and putting them on a flatbed scanner. That's how we split this up. He did flatbed scanning. No camera. Mine's all camera. How's that for distinction, right? Um, anyway, they said, sure, take the lids off. That let me get light down in them. Otherwise, it was dark under the lid. And, <sighs> so sometimes you just have to ask when you're trying to do something uh, to keep kind of asking and say, well, what about could I, you know? And eventually, they'll let you do it. Now, the fish collection, Mark Kivy was just you know, do anything you want, pull them out, throw them on the flatbed scanner, it's fine, just don't let them dry out all the way. Um, in some of the, ah, there's Fred on the flatbed scanner with one of his fish. What's that called, a ratfish? Yeah, that's a ratfish. Yeah. It, it's got teeth like a rat, and it lives in the bottom, down in the mud and all, which is why it's white. You know, it comes up at night. It's called a rat. Oh, it's really ugly. It's beautifully ugly. Just, you know. Wonderfully ugly. So here's this guy again with the lid off the top so I can get light down in. But sometimes I also, I decided to shoot down in there. And he almost seems alive. These things seem expressive. Like, like maybe he's going to jump out of that jar at me. Um, and these jars, oh, interesting, companions in the jars. 
and looking at how they start relating to each other within the jars. Um, this is exhibition we had of both our bodies of work down at uh, Fort Hayes a year ago. Oh, here's one of Fred Scan Fish. How tall is that guy? Eight feet? Seven, seven feet, eight feet? Almost eight feet tall. Uh, mine aren't quite that big. Um, but this is how I was framing them in the black field. And I was grouping things to make relationships between them as they were grouped together. But what do you do with the jar? Look at, look at this face. Look at this. You know, it's like, oh my God, look. Um, <laughs> you could just go, cra I did almost go crazy. Um, spending time doing this. And I was fascinated by some of these small fish. And look at these labels on these jars that document where they were found, what specimen date, exactly where they were found, how many were there. And they're all within these little tubes for these little guys. Uh, some other ones, I have no idea. They're wrapped. They're wrapped in, in gauzy fabric. Um, oh, these guys, the paddlefish, they're really wild, really long um, paddlefish. And here's, oh, these. I saw that cotton, it's all under liquid. The cotton in the end of the jar is to keep them discreet and not intermixing with each other, of course. And I thought, God, they look like clouds, mm -hmm. don't they? And uh, I was like, oh, wow. And then the jar, turning it around, um, I just love the ball jar and the ideal on there in the USA on, you know, had to be this angle. Now, many of these things I photographed from two and three sides and decided later exactly what was going to be my, my final thing on it. Again, without the staff focus, you wouldn't have been able to read that. Oh, this poor little guy all by itself. It seems to be just like screaming down at the bottom. Um, ah, yes. These, is that a lionfish, Fred? Or, I don't remember. Um, just incredible, strange fins and coloration on them. Uh, but I ended up, in this case, using that jar like that so it looked like I was dropping it down in a frame. You know, like I was, you know, it wasn't, but black on black. It's easy then. Oh, and this guy. Oh, makes me think of Chinese, uh, land, uh, Chinese dragons, some kind of dragonfish. The tetrapod collection, tetrapods are anything with four legs, and they count birds as tetrapods because they got four armatures, okay? So tetrapod collection. Um, I get in there and it's like, oh, cases after cases and drawers and drawers of these things. And um, they're, it's really packed in really tight. And it's like, how can I photograph these things? And initially, trying to work with them, this is where you just keep going and things change. Um, pulling out the drawers, they had labels on the end of the drawer that would tell you, you know, what you're going to find inside that drawer. And I was really interested in the way they had put the drawers together. And here's a drawer that I opened up. Um, I'm shooting straight down in it. It's me standing over here at the side. And I had the tripod kind of up on this cabinet trying to be able to figure out how to photograph it. That's the way the drawer opened. And I wasn't entirely thrilled about it. The most I did was reach back further in the drawer, because these drawers are 24 by 36 inches deep. So there were more birds further back, and I brought some forward to make this composition. I was very interested in all the handwritten labels. And some of these were from, I think the oldest one I found was 1840-something, um, one of these birds. Some of them, well, I'll get into that. Some of them are extinct, but um, unusual things. These owls, you can see my tri two of my tripod legs, the third one's up on the cabinet. And my gym shoes. Um, trying to figure out, oh, God, that, this guy is just like, oh, how do I photograph that thing? Well, eventually, I talked them into the guy that was the intern working it would pull the drawer out for me. 
and I could set it on the floor and set my camera up and be able to photograph it. Eventually, they let me pull them out myself. But I had to prove myself over a series of days that I wasn't gonna do something stupid or dump them or hurt them or mistreat them or any of that sort of thing. And they kind of left me alone, much like Mark did over in Fishes and just said, have fun, you know. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is kind of the way that setup started working out with the black uh, around them, surrounding them. The most I ever did was maybe a little bit of moving, angling sort of thing. Uh, the color combinations, just love them. The blues and purples, can you tell? Blues and purples. Um, and if you would go down this row, there'd be males and females labeled, etc. So when it came to, oops, oh, tetrapods, four, four legs on it, yeah. Let me get to these real quick here. Um, these guys in a jar, here I am shooting that jar, top off so the light can get down in there, and I'm doing that slight change of focus. And I'm using cable release. And, uh, I love this snapping turtle. He's like, look at that face. He's like, he's going to come get me right away. Um, anyway, me figuring out the snapping turtle. Okay, so what am I going to do? 24, 36, I want to make them one-to-one. -one. I want to make those drawers that big. So how am I going to display them? And I like grids and all that. And we had the show, as I said, down at Fort Hayes. So um, I figured it out and took this one wall and these are uh, 32 by 44 inch paper. I found giant push pins, much bigger than normal. So it kind of looks to me as if you had four by six prints that you might put up on a bulletin board with push pins. And I called this my researcher's wall because of course you could see the detail and you can read all the labels and everything. Fort Hayes is a really interesting place to show work because there's middle school, high school, all the schools around Columbus will come and, and see these things. So there it is, kind of straight on, what that looked like. Um, <laughs> there's that one hanging on a wall. You can see how terrible it is with all the reflections in it. So frustrating. You need black spaces with just a little bit of light. Uh, the Triple Horn Insect Collection is another just world-renowned, incredible collection. This is, um, you're probably used to these, these things that are ways of storing things here. It's open down here and you do this to move a whole big thing down to the next opening. Um, and there's all these wood, they're almost all wood boxes like this. Some are handmade. Some of them are quite old collections. Um, the curator was just, again, wonderful with me. She would pull the top so I didn't have any glass reflections to work with. And eventually she actually let me move some things myself when she saw how I, I uh, worked with them. But here she is putting one of the boxes down below. Um, I think that's a 12 inch ruler. So that's about, you know, 13, 14 inch is the size of it. Um, weird things, these beetles, it, almost looks like it's doing, I hate to say this, the O-H-I-O -O up here. <laughs> but um, eh, I figure somebody did that on purpose. Um, I was just amazed at the similarities and yet the subtle color differences, like the blues in there. Um, they, they're displayed both sides so that you can see both sides and and uh, yeah, and sometimes like this folded in half so you see that shape of it. And she was explaining to me what some of these things are. I learn stuff all the time. Uh, a lot of this has to do with, you know how they put their wings up like this when they're on flowers and all? That's so if a bird sees them, they think they're a bug and they come and take this because they think it's the head <laughs> and they're protected. I had no idea. Um, this happens to be a box with a collection of just everything <laughs> in it. 
Um, so I was photographing these boxes and then looking at relationships from one box to another and uh, trying to lay them out. This is her personal research area. These bugs are uh, parasites and they implant in other bugs their eggs sort of thing and that's what she's studying. Amazing. Um, so, and so what to do with these? So here they are. These are like 44 by 44 inch prints. So they're actually larger than life size. Um, and I'm looking right now at uh, putting together combinations like this and altering the size and considering this to be like 80 inches long, as long as some of my big Diana pieces. So um, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I am two minutes over time, sorry. Uh, the, oh, future plan. I, I plan to get back there, do more, of course, but I want to talk to them about what our animals, what birds are, what insects are extinct or near extinct. For instance, the uh, ivory-billed woodpecker over here is either extinct or considered extinct at this point because they have not been seen in 60 years or something. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in documenting that because uh, it's making a point about you know, what's going on in our environment and what we're losing and how to document it and please let's not lose any more and yada, yada, yada. <sighs> Questions, nobody asked a question in the middle of that, yes. Well, Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. I can do something better with a camera. And now do we have questions? Okay. Um, I'm not sure how to frame my question, but maybe you'll understand it. I, I hear the documentary and the artistic. Mm -hmm. Are they ever in conflict, or is it always a nice relationship? Um, they can be in conflict, but I think it depends upon who's about doing it. There is a, an image maker, Susan Mizellis, that's been doing um, conflicts around the world, war images, but you look at those aesthetically, they are wonderful and beautiful and it's ugly things happening. Um, there's that. There's, uh, yes, it, it's always gone on. That documentary is artistic or can be. Um, and well be artistic along with being good documentary too. And I suppose it's something we all strive for if we care about those kinds of things. Yeah. What kind of work do you do? What would? What I do? Mm -hmm. um, I study animals in the for several years. Oh, well, that would be fun. They are documents and they are artistic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, just the pages and what that, ah, yeah, what that, that fun, letter, yeah, that'd be fun. Fred loves, oh, he's love totally into opera. You two should get together. I love to have you get photographed. <laughs> there you go. Yes. I did, I, I didn't understand stack focus. I could understand how you were focusing them. I didn't mm -hmm. understand how you stacked them up that path. Yeah, um, years ago, <laughs> insane to even try it now. It's, it's a quick thing in Photoshop. If you go online and go stack focus Photoshop, there's videos, there's, it's really easy. Right. You have X number of images that you have done this different focus with and um, you open them and you stack them in, in Photoshop. It's one of the uh, things you can do when they come in and then you have it uh, compile them and they end up with, I, I had more slides, but I, you know, time. Um, it could be four, five, six, eight layers, and each layer it is masked, so you know what part it's using, and you can turn some things off and move things around, and, you know, and then you just flatten them, and you got it. It's really amazing. The black... Yeah, um, there was one light up above. It's a single light. There was tin foil, black foil on it to really make it very distinct. 
and only hit that area. And I've since then found a wand, because it was circular, um, a long skinny wand that I'll be able to use and even be more precise about it. So the butterflies are available light. Butterflies, yeah, were available light. So you just in, uh, white balance in the Yeah, I mean, um, digital is so incredible. I mean, it's made, it's almost made me lazy. In, in terms of you know not having to worry about things. I mean, you see it right away, you know if you got it, if you miss the focus, if the composition's off, you can change it right away, and you can correct color easily. And I use a program called Lightroom, which is where every, all the images are. I only use Photoshop when I'm trying to do something special with it. And in Lightroom, you can easily correct the color balance, et cetera. I was going to ask, what was the reason why you picked Fort Hayes? How would you well, it would have been, yeah, but where can I show it here on campus? Well, I was wondering if that would be the answer. Nowhere. <laughs> they won't even allow photographs on the first floor of this building. Right. So. so it's not facility, it's regulation. It's, it's who's controlling the limited, very limited gallery space and what they're willing to. I tried to get um, over in Hopkins. Didn't work. Uh, we well, knew that. Yeah. Yep. There was a lot of a lot of work there. So yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. There. You know. I mean, OSU's got uh, the urban art space, and there, I'm. You know, I'm. I'm from here, so I'm nobody. You know. I. It's yeah. <laughs> they only want. Fancy names, yes. I thought you, I think your work is extremely beautiful. Mm. Um, Thank you. And I was, I was struck by how at the beginning of your show, when you got to the fish, mm -hmm. and then when you came back to the insects, I had the impression I was seeing the same composition over and over again, uh, characterized by strong verticals. And, and horizontal. Uh, uh, compartments. Mm -hmm. Or uh, the vegetation, in the case of the garden, uh, the garden, the, the the objects in the compartments were playing off against one another. I don't know if that's. Thanks for noticing. I mean, I, no, no. I mean, I think I have a relatively consistent way of seeing. A um, pretty well-known photo person one time uh, for uh, review of work for grants said something afterwards about, was that my work? He recognized my vision of seeing things, even though it was stuff he had never seen before. And that meant more to me than not getting a grant, you know, that he had recognized that. So thank you for recognizing it. I think there's a consistency. It's part of why I go back into the Diana stuff and some of the Polaroid stuff and like that. There's a, a way I've been approaching the world and landscape and objects and people and things for a long time. Sure. Oh, yeah, look at them up close. I have just a few things yeah, for yeah. the business meeting, but thank you again. Okay.